Hi, my name is JJ Behrens. I'm a developer advocate at Google. In this episode of Dart Essence, I'm going to show you a variety of ways to use Dart with Google Web Toolkit. I know that there are a lot of GWT developers out there who would like to give Dart a shot, but they can't because they already have a large, successful app that's written in GWT. I'm going to show you ways to integrate Dart into your existing GWT application without having to rewrite it from scratch. If you'd like to download the sample code, the URL is bit.ly slash dart underscore with underscore GWT. To do this, I've built a sample application that uses both GWT and Dart. I'll show you how to set up a development environment so that you could work with both technologies. Then I'll show you a variety of ways in which you could get GWT and Dart to interoperate, such as using GWT and Dart to manage different parts of the same page, using Dart to retrieve JSON from a Java servlet, using window.postmessage and Jisney to pass messages between GWT and Dart, using JavaScript, Jisney, and Dart's JS package for synchronous interoperability between GWT and Dart, using custom event objects and Elemental to pass messages between GWT and Dart. Rather than show you a one-size-fits-all solution, I decided to show you a bunch of approaches so that you could pick the right tool for the job. Each of them has strengths and weaknesses, and I'll cover those along the way as well. By the way, this video is best viewed full screen. Also, be sure to set the YouTube player to play it 720p HD. Let's quickly cover how I set up my development environment. I used Eclipse and Dart Editor to build the sample application. If you're a GWT developer, you're probably already very familiar with how to install Eclipse, so I won't bore you with that. The GWT website has some pretty decent instructions. I used the Juno release of the Eclipse IDE for Java EE developers. Then I installed the Google plugin for Eclipse. I decided to install everything, but the most important things are Google Web Toolkit and Google App Engine Java SDK. The instructions also walk you through installing Google Web Toolkit developer plugin for Chrome. To install Dart, head on over to dartlang.org. If you've never installed Dart Editor before, there's even a getting started guide. I like to use Dart and various other tools from the command line, so I have the following in my bash RC. Of course, you could also rely on Dart Editor to run those tools for you. Dart Editor is based on Eclipse components, so it kind of looks like a very stripped down version of Eclipse. You might be wondering why I don't use the Dart Editor plugin for Eclipse. Unfortunately, it's not yet as polished as Dart Editor is. I recommend keeping Dart Editor separate of Eclipse for the time being until things settle down and a few key bugs get fixed. Using Eclipse to edit Java and Dart Editor to edit Dart actually works out pretty well for me. You can still use Eclipse with the eGit plugin to commit your Dart files to Git, but I tend to use the command line to interact with Git anyway because that's where I'm most comfortable. Let's start by creating a GWT application. Then I'll embed a Dart application within it. Finally, I'll show how to use GWT and Dart to manage different parts of the same page. Since GWT and Dart each have their own requirements for how the application should be laid out, I'm going to start by creating a GWT application. So I'm going to come here and select New Web Application Project. I'm going to call it GWT Application because I'm a, you know, kind of a creative guy. I'll put it in application and leave it in my workspace. I'm going to use Google Web Toolkit and Google App Engine, and that's it. So I'll go ahead and finish that. So here's the application, and it has a war directory. The war directory is where all the static files go, so that's where my Dart application is going to go. I'm going to create the Dart application from within Dart Editor. So I'm going to create a new application. I'm going to call it Dart Application. and you can see here that it's within the war directory of my GWT application. I'll include sample content and make it a web application and hit finish. Now I like the project layout that Dart Editor set up for me, uh, but I don't need the CSS file and I don't need this HTML file and I'm going to delete most of the start file, so I'm going to go ahead and do that really quickly. By the way, if you're using Git, Here's my git ignore file. Now I'm going to get rid of most of the sample code that Eclipse created. You have to do it in the right order or you'll get errors. Remember to delete the reference to the servlet in web.xml or else the app won't start correctly. I'm also going to mostly empty out the GWT application class. 
Now all I'm left with is an empty on module load method in the git application.java file. Now let's fire up the git application in Eclipse. I'm going to select debug as web application and select git application.html. And this takes a few seconds to start up and there's the URL. If I double click on it, it starts in Chrome. Of course, there's not much there right now. If you haven't yet installed the Google Web Toolkit plugin for Chrome, it'll walk you through that at this point. By the way, if you downloaded the source code for the sample project and you're trying to get it to work, remember that to run the Dart code you need to either use Dartium, that is the copy of Chromium that comes with Dart Editor, or you need to compile the code to JavaScript using Dart to JS, which again can be done with Dart Editor. It's a common mistake to try to run the code in regular Chrome before you've compiled the Dart to JavaScript. That won't work yet. I should also mention that although GWT's development mode works for most of the code in this tutorial, it doesn't yet work for Elemental. So if you've downloaded the sample code, you'll need to actually compile it and strip off the GWT code server parameter before you can view the application. Now let's edit the HTML file in the war directory. First, I'll get rid of most of the comments so that it's easier to see what's going on. Now I'm going to tweak the title and the h1 for the page. Now I'm going to get rid of this HTML here. Notice that I've used an h2 for the GWT section and an h2 for the Dart section. And I've also created a div for the GWT section and a div for the Dart section. And I could plug into these from the GWT and the Dart code respectively. Now I'm going to add two script tags. The first one is my dart application.dart file, and then the second one is the standard dart to dart.js file. Now this dart.js file is responsible for seeing if the browser supports dart, and if it does, you know, everything's good. If it doesn't, it loads the corresponding JavaScript version of my dart application.dart file. The dart.js file actually gets created by pub, dart's package manager thanks to our dependence on the browser package. Now let's do hello world in GWT by having GWT print something to the page. I've added a vertical panel to the GWT div. I've also created a print string method that can add new labels to the vertical panel. Let's try it out. I reloaded the page in Chrome and now it says GWT application loaded. Great, GWT is now interacting with the HTML page. Now let's do the same thing in Dart. Let's edit the dart application.dart file that lives deep within GWT's war directory. However, let's edit it in dart editor. First I query for the dart div, then I create a print string method like I did for GWT. Notice the cool method cascade syntax that saves me from writing div two times. Also notice that I'm setting the text property of the div element rather than the inner HTML property. That way I don't have to worry about cross-site scripting attacks. Now, I could call print string to say that the Dart application has loaded. At this point, I could compile the Dart to JavaScript. However, during development, it's much faster to run the code in Dartium. I'm going to copy the URL from Chrome and then come over here to my Dart editor directory where I have Dart editor and click on Chromium. Now, this is actually Dartium and it understands Dart natively and so it's going to run the code natively and there we go it says Dart application loaded so Dart is interacting with the HTML page furthermore you can see that Dart and GWT are both running on the same page at the same time managing different parts of the same page later I'll show you how they could work even more closely now is a great time for me to show you how to debug your code in Dart editor even though the code is being served from a web server running in Eclipse, you could still debug the code in Dart Editor. I just need to create a custom launch configuration with the correct URL. So I'll come up here and manage launches. I already got rid of all the other launch configurations, so I'm going to create a new one with Dartium. I'll call it Dartium. And here's the URL that we used. We got this from our Chrome launch. And we'll run in checked mode and so forth and we need to pick the project which is of course start application and I'll go ahead and run that great this time I'm gonna set a breakpoint in the editor and I'm gonna go ahead and run that again and it dumps me immediately back into dart editor and you could see my various uh, variables um, I'll go ahead and step over the code a little bit. 
So we have a Dart div, window, and so forth. And here's my stack. And so you can see that I could debug my Dart code from within Dart Editor. Another thing that I could do is come over here to generate JavaScript. And that's going to compile my Dart to JavaScript. And then I could go over to Chrome. Then from within Chrome, I'll select Tools, Developer Tools. Click on the gear icon here. And I will enable Source Maps. Great, that's done already. And then come over here to Sources. I'll have to get rid of this real quick. And then it, uh, I could pick from here the Dart application Dart. And notice this is Chrome. It doesn't actually understand Dart. But because of source maps, it's able to show me the Dart code. And from here, I'm even able to set breakpoints and debug it uh, from within Chrome. If you're using GWT, it's very likely you have Java on the server side too. Hence, it's important that your Dart code be able to talk to your Java code on the server. If you're used to using GWT, you may be accustomed to using GWT RPC to talk to your Java servlets. Unfortunately, that's not an option for Dart. The protocol is very specific to GWT and Java. However, you could certainly generate JSON using your Java servlet and then consume that JSON from Dart using an XML HTTP request. It's not as slick as GWT RPC, but it definitely works. Let me show you how to do that. Here's the code for a servlet that serves JSON. In this code, I'm hard coding the JSON, but naturally, you could generate the JSON dynamically using a JSON library. In order to make use of JSON servlet.java, you have to edit web.xml and tie the servlet to a particular HTTP path. This requires a servlet tag and a servlet mapping tag. Notice the URL that I used. Let's restart the application and check to make sure that the servlet is actually generating the JSON correctly. I can view that URL in Chrome. Good, it looks like the application is generating JSON correctly. Now let's look at Dart application .dart in Dart Editor. I use HTTP request .git string to fetch a URL. Rather than take a callback, it returns a future object. I register a success handler using the then method and an error handler using the catch error method. The use of futures is pretty pervasive in Dart, both on the client side as well as the server side, so this code will look familiar if you're a Dart developer. In this code, I'm just printing out the JSON response, but it's trivial to parse it using the Dart colon JSON library. Now that we've covered getting Dart to talk to your Java server, let's cover how to get Dart and GWT to talk to one another. One approach that HTML5 provides for getting different things to talk to each other in a browser is window.postmessage. You could use window.postmessage for lots of things, such as communicating with your C code written using NACL, or getting web pages from different domains to communicate. It's also one way of getting Dart and GWT to talk to one another. They could simply pass messages back and forth. However, since GWT doesn't have native support for window.postmessage, I'll need to use Jisney, GWT's JavaScript native interface. In the following, I'm going to show you six pieces of code. How to call post message from GWT and then from Dart, how to listen for post message from GWT and then from Dart, and how to create a button to generate a post message from GWT and then from Dart. Once that's all done, I'll show it to you with all the pieces working together. First, let me show you how to call post message from GWT. This requires Jisney, the JavaScript native interface for GWT. I create a method called post message that takes a string message. Notice that I use the native keyword. The body of the method is a weird mix of JavaScript and Jisney, hidden in a comment. In order to call window.postmessage, I have to call $wnd.postmessage. Now let me show you how to call post message from Dart. Hmm, well that's not very exciting. Now let me show you how to listen for message events in GWT. Let's start by calling a new method called listen for post message in on module load. Now I have to implement listen for post message. Just like before, this requires Jisney, which is why I had to pull the code for listen for post message out of on module load and into its own method. The key part is window.addEventListener, where we listen for message events. That takes a callback. Notice that I have to set var that equals this. This is a little JavaScript trick that's necessary because of a weird scoping issue in JavaScript. Inside the add event listener listener, there's a really long piece of code that has a fully qualified class name. This is the Jisney code necessary to call back into Java. I call from JavaScript into my onPostMessage, which is a simple Java method. 
The nice thing is that Disney takes care of casting the data to the right types when calling on post message. Inside on post message, I just print a string saying that Gwit has received a post message. Here's how to listen for post message in Dart. Once again, Dart provides an API, so it's pretty easy. I just call window.onMessage.listen and pass a callback. Notice the convenient function expression syntax, the use of triple quotes, and the use of string interpolation. Now let's create a button in GWT. Clicking on the button will send a post message. This code is fairly straightforward. It just calls the post message method that we wrote earlier. Now let's look at the Dart code to do the same thing. I create a new button element and set some properties on it. I add the GWT button class to it to make sure it looks the same as the button I created in GWT. My onClick listener just calls window.postMessage directly. Now let's see if everything works. First I'll restart the server just in case. Then I'll hit reload in Dartium. I click on each of the buttons first to generate a post message from GWT and then to generate a post message from Dart. Notice that it doesn't matter who sends the post message, both sides receive it. That's just something you have to keep in mind when you use post message the way we're using it. From the browser's perspective, there's no difference between whether Dart or GWT is calling window.postmessage. By the way, I'm kind of ignoring the origin of the post message. You could read more about post message online to learn about the security implications of properly checking the origin, but that's outside the scope of this tutorial. Window.postmessage is a useful tool to have in your toolbox because it can work in a variety of situations, as I mentioned earlier. However, since Dart and GWT both have an API for JavaScript interoperability, you could use JavaScript as an in intermediary between Dart and GWT. They can even synchronously call each other's methods. This lets you do very fine-grained interoperability. However, this fine-grained interoperability comes with a cost. First of all, using Dart's JS package can almost double the size of the generated JavaScript for Dart. In my, sem in my sample, it made the JavaScript 89% larger. Secondly, because Dart can run natively in Dartium, and because doing distributed garbage collection across two virtual machines is non-trivial, using the JS package to integrate with JavaScript in Dart requires a little more work than in other languages that always compile to JavaScript. Rather than show you how to put a single callback function on the window object, I'm going to show you how to create a JavaScript module so that you can have lots of callback functions. Hence, I'm going to show you four things. How to create a JavaScript module and a callback function in GWT, and then in Dart, how to call the Dart callback from GWT, and how to call the GWT callback from Dart. Just like I did for post message, I'll create a button on each side that the user can click on in order to invoke the callbacks. First, let's start with GWT. In on module load, I'll call a new method, init GWT application module. Init GWT application module is implemented using Jisney. I set window.gwit application module to a new JavaScript object that contains a single method, GWT callback. GWT callback is a JavaScript method that calls a Java method that is also called GWT callback. Hence, with just a little bit of Disney code, I've set up a JavaScript module where I could add as many callbacks as I need, and I can implement those callbacks using Java. To make it even more realistic, the GWT callback method takes three parameters, an int, a string, and a JavaScript object. I did this to show you that Dart and GWT can pass complex JavaScript objects back and forth to each other. Finally, the GWT callback method returns a string. There's another interesting thing to notice. The Java version of GWT callback receives a JavaScript object passed from Dart instance rather than a JavaScript object instance. This is based on GWT's notion of JavaScript overlay types. The JavaScript object passed from Dart class extends JavaScript object and it adds a hello method implemented in Jisney so that the Java code can interact more easily with the JavaScript object passed from Dart. As a final comment, unlike with post message where the message was asynchronous and went to everyone listening for messages, in this case the callback is synchronous, only goes to a single listener, and even has a return value. Nonetheless, the implementation isn't too different from the code we used for post message. Over on the Dart side, the code looks very different. First I have to add the JS package as a dependency in my pubspec.yaml. 
Dart Editor recognizes when I change pubspec.yaml and will automatically run pub install for me to update my dependencies. If it doesn't, you could always select Tools Reanalyze Sources. Next, I have to add some code in Dart application.dart. I start by importing the JS package using the prefix JS. Now let's look at the code for setting up the JavaScript module. In this code, js.context is basically a reference to the JavaScript window object. I create a new JavaScript object using js.map and I assign it to js.context.dart application module. Then inside the JavaScript object, I create a new callback called dart callback that references a dart function that is also called dart callback. Notice that Dart's JavaScript interoperability API doesn't let you sling little bits of JavaScript all over the place. Furthermore, the API requires that you be a little bit more explicit about how memory is managed. For instance, notice that the use of js.scoped, which sets up a memory context. The Dart team did it this way because dealing with distributed garbage collection when you have two entirely separate VMs is a very difficult problem. On the other hand, the Dart code is pure Dart. It's easy to create a JavaScript object using js.map, and it's easy to set up a callback that will call back into Dart using js.callback. In this case, the callback might be called many times instead of just once, so I use js.callback.many rather than js.callback.once. By the way, the astute reader might be wondering if Dart has JavaScript overlay types like Gwit does. If you look at the Dart version of Dart callback, you'll see that Dart can interact with the JavaScript object without needing to create a specific JavaScript overlay type. That's because Dart uses a js.proxy object to act as a proxy object for the JavaScript object. This is very convenient because it lets you use the JavaScript object as if it were a native Dart object. On the other hand, Gwit's JavaScript overlay types do have one benefit. They work very well with code completion in Eclipse. Code completion in Dart Editor isn't particularly helpful with JS proxy objects since JS proxy is a dynamic proxy which is based on Dart's no such method feature. Now let's look at how to call the Dart callback from Gwit. Just like before, I set up a button that the user could click on in order to call the callback. This calls a Disney method called call Dart callback, which I'll create in just a moment. I can pass in an int and a string directly to call Dart callback, but in order to create a native JavaScript object, I use another Disney method called create object for callback. The create object for callback method is just a simple Disney method that just returns an opaque JavaScript object. Inside the method, you can see that the JavaScript object itself is very simple. The call Dart callback method is a Disney method that takes an int, a string, and the JavaScript object that we created in create object for callback. Then it calls window.dart application module dot dart callback, which is pretty much how you'd call the callback from JavaScript. Notice that call dart callback returns the string that is that is returned by the dart callback. Now let's look at the dart code to invoke the GWT callback. Once again, I create a button element. This time, however, the onClick.listen event handler makes use of the JS library in order to call js.context.gwit callback. Remember that js.context is Dart's reference to JavaScript's window object. I pass three parameters to the GWT callback function, an int, a string, and a JavaScript object, which I create with js.map. Finally, I print the result of the callback. Okay, now that we have all the code, let's try it out. I'm going to call the Dart callback from Gwit, and the Dart callback is called with these parameters, and it says that Dart received the callback, which is the return value. Now I'm going to call the Gwit callback from Dart, and Gwit, the Gwit callback is called with these parameters, and Dart says that Gwit received the callback, which is the return value. It really is possible to get Gwit and Dart to talk to each other synchronously using JavaScript as an ink intermediary. The last approach I'm going to show you is the most bleeding edge. Just like the section in which I used window.postmessage to send events between Gwit and Dart, you can also use custom event objects. However, this time, instead of using Disney to work with APIs that Gwit doesn't natively support, I'll show you how to use Elemental. While I can't say that there was actual blood involved in developing this part of the sample, I can say that it was pretty painful to be so close to the bleeding edge. There were a bunch of hurdles to overcome, and there isn't much documentation on Elemental or how to use custom event objects in Gwit and Dart. 
Elemental is a new library for fast, lightweight, and to-the-metal web programming in GWT. It's intended for developers who are comfortable working with the browser APIs that JavaScript programmers use. Elemental is very convenient since it doesn't require you to write any JSON code. However, it's still a fairly new technology. Not only is it woefully underdocumented, but it's also currently incompatible with GWT's development mode plugin. One approach is to switch to Super Dev Mode, which is an experimental replacement for GWT's development mode plugin. However, there are currently a lot of drawbacks to using Super Dev Mode. After consulting with another GWT developer at Google, I opted for the safe, albeit slow and painful route of recompiling to JavaScript and restarting the server every time I make a change. This works, although it does put a cramp in your style. Let's start on the GWT side by setting up Elemental. Elemental does come with GWT, but to actually use it, you have to copy the jar file from the SDK bundle into your project. I like to do this from the command line. First, I cd into my Eclipse directory because I know the SDK bundle is in there somewhere. Then, I find the jar file. Now I copy that file into GWT application slash war slash web inf slash lib. Now I have to tell Eclipse to make use of the new jar file, so I'm going to right click on the project and hit refresh. And then in the lib directory, I'm going to find the GWT elemental jar file that I copied over, right click on that, and add it to my build path. Now I have to set up elemental in the GWT application.gwt.xml file. All I have to do is say that the module inherits from elemental.elemental. .elemental. At this point, it's not a bad idea to clean the project, run GWT compile, and restart the server. If you're following along, remember that Elemental is currently incompatible with GWT's development mode. So that not only means you'll have to recompile it, the Java code each time, I'm also going to have to change the Dartium launch configuration. So I'm going to go here and manage launch, click here, and the key thing is that I need to remove this parameter for, called GWT code server. So I'm going to apply that and run that. Great, things still work. Another word of warning about elemental imports in GWT. com.google.gwt and elemental each have separate APIs for interacting with the browser. Hence, there's a lot of overlapping class names. Pay close attention to where you import classes from. In this section, we'll mostly be importing classes from elemental. Now here's the code to generate a custom event object in GWT. Just like before, I create a button that the user could click on to generate the custom event. I create the custom event using document.createEvent custom event, and I cast a return value to a custom event. For the detail property, I create a JSON object using JS JSON object.create. Notice that I don't need to use JSON to create a JavaScript object. Then I shove a bunch of data into it. Next, I call init custom event past it passing in the custom event type and the detail property. I serialize the detail object to JSON using the toJSON method. Finally, I call window.dispatchEvent. By the way, it may be possible to skip serialization to JSON, but I wasn't able to get it to work with Dart under both Dartium and dart to js The code to listen for a custom event is even more straightforward. It too is free of JSON code. I use add event listener to listen for the custom Dart event. Then in the event handler, I cast the event to a custom event. I unpack the detail property using json.parse. After that, it's smooth sailing. Here's how to generate a custom event object in Dart. I create a normal Dart map with all the data that I want to pass. Next, I create a custom event using Dart's custom event constructor. I serialize the detail to json using json.stringify. Finally, I call window.dispatchEvent to dispatch the custom event. To listen for custom event objects using the new streams API, I start by creating an event stream provider called custom event stream provider. You don't have to do this for most types of events, but custom events are, well, custom. Now I can listen for custom events on the window object using the custom event stream provider that I created earlier. When I receive one, I unpack the detail property using json.parse. json.parse returns a normal Dart map. After that, it's once again smooth sailing. To show everything working, I need to compile the GWT to JavaScript and restart the server. So I'm going to, re I'm going to right click on the GWT application, go to Google, GWT compile, compile. And now that that's done, I'm going to restart the server. 
Now in Dartium, I could generate a custom Gwit event and Dart receives it. And I could generate a custom Dart event and Gwit receives it. Great. Dartium's great, but let's compile it to JavaScript so we could run it in other browsers. Here it is running in standard Chrome. And here it is running in Firefox. The other buttons work as well. Great, my work here is done. I hope I've convinced you that if you already have a large GWT app, but you want to give Dart a try, you shouldn't feel like you have to rewrite your whole app. You could dip your toes in the water to see if you like it. By the way, here are a couple of other projects that you might be interested in, although I haven't had a chance yet to check them out. As I was building this sample, I made heavy use of the GWT and Dart documentation, and I kept a list of links that I found particularly helpful. You could check the transcript for all the details. Thanks for watching. You could download the sample source code and the transcript for this video from bit.ly slash dart with GWT. If you'd like to learn more about Dart, check out dartlang.org. And if you have any questions about using Dart with GWT, post them to Stack Overflow using the tags Dart and GWT. If you'd like to follow me on Google+, here's a link to my profile. Thank <laughs> you.